Hello. How's everyone doing? Wow, loud. Uh, my name's Chris Failer. I'm PR and product manager over at Gearbox Software. And I've got a lot of my coworkers that I'd like to introduce you to today. First up, we have Anthony Birch, writer of Borderlands 2. We have Graham Timmons, our lead level designer. Amanda Christensen, one of our concept artists. Ashley Rochelle, a content artist. She'll tell you what that means. And CEO and President, Randy Pitchford. Hi. <laughs> Hi. Here, I think we have enough mics. Yeah, this, yeah everybody gets okay. their own mic. We can all scoot down one so we don't have to be separate from Chris. Oh, you you sure? Or should we just not? You know what? Okay. Let's keep a healthy distance. Chris, Chris is over there. We're over here. All right. How are we doing? So what are we doing, Chris? Well, I'm showing everybody your names right now. Cool. So most of us have Twitters too. Um, Anthony is Reverend Anthony, and he's really funny. So you should follow Reverend Anthony. Yeah. Uh, we'll have all of that on a slide at the end. Cool. Spoilers. Spoilers. This will end. OK, so we're going to cover a couple topics today. First off, we're all thrilled that, to be here and excited that you guys are here, too. So the group to my left here today, they're going to talk about how and why Gearbox has tried to make more inclusive games and everything that they've done and hope to do in the future. Uh, then from there, we want to hear from you guys. What can we do moving ahead? And answer any of the questions that you may have in the time before they kick us out. <laughs> so that said, let's get underway. <laughs> what are we looking at? Anthony, that's Ellie cosplay. I'm oh, just yeah. skipping ahead, right ahead. Yeah, I, uh, yeah, that's that's awesome. Yeah, so uh, just really briefly, uh, and it's gonna be kind of masturbatory, but I just want to sort of set a baseline for like what we've been trying to do, so that when we talk to you about what we can do better, you can like have a point of reference. Um, so apologies for me masturbating. Um, but <laughs> in Borderlands 2, we did try to do a lot of work to have uh, characters that were inclusive of different body types, like Ellie, for example. Um, when we see um, a cosplay like that, it's it's the best thing in the entire world um, to to us. And uh, we had characters like uh, like Sir Hammerlock, who is gay, and um, there there were also certain characters that we found out uh, after Ship had some interest. So like Axton uh, was what is the playable soldier, and uh, I had written a, a piece of dialogue for him that initially I assumed would be triggered based on which character you're reviving, where he would like hit on the person he's reviving because it's really intimate. You're like getting close and like lifting them up, and he would say, uh, "Oh, cool, do you like work out?" Or, or and he would just think you were really hot, and then we didn't ever put in the code that made him limit that to just one of the female characters. Uh, and so he sort of became bisexual by accident. And I, <laughs> and I, I mentioned that in, in an interview, and uh, a lot of people on our forums were like, oh, that's awesome. Like, you have a bisexual protagonist. We're like, oh, cool. Well, then it was totally intentional, and everything's great. And, um, <laughs> So we did that, and uh, there's a character called Mr. Torg that, uh, that I wrote that started out as basically just a really uh, horribly stereotypical ma uh, Macho Man Randy Savage uh, type character who would like say like actually offensive things because I was, I, I think all of us are still learning and trying to be less shitty people as we go on, and when I started writing the game three years ago, I was, mar I was markedly more shitty than I am now. So he would say things like, if you don't like explosions, you're probably wearing women's underwear, like haha, stupid sexist bullshit like that. And then as I uh, tried to get less fucking stupid in my life, he's became more and more of like a fun like social justice warrior kind of guy. So like <laughs> when you meet him in the last DLC, he's having an argument about how Ellie is really, really pretty. And if you can't see that, then your body politics need work. And <laughs> 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 
Thank you. So yeah, um, that's kind of how we've tried to diversify the cast of, of, of Borderlands 2, and we do so, uh, at least partially, and you guys can elaborate on this and I'll stop talking, um, because we believe that, uh, and I, when I say we, I don't mean everybody at Gearbox, because the liability and we don't want to speak for anybody else and all that shit. Um, but that, you know, making art more inclusive can make the world a better place. Um, uh, Mae Jameson is the first black female astronaut in space, and when people ask her who her inspiration was, she said, who are on Star Trek? Like, there's a direct correlation between cool pop culture character leading to real life things being better. So that's sort of the thing that makes me interested in, in making more diverse casts, and I'll stop talking. No, that's true. Yeah. <laughs> And, and from a studio point of view, it's, it's really important. You know, it, the, the civil rights era had done most of its import, most important work before I was even born. And on one hand, I can, any one of us should be frustrated every day that some of us aren't given equal respect or even rights in this world. But it's pretty exciting to be part, to be able to be here today, to be part of the movement that's going on. Um, when I founded the studio, there were people that joined my studio who were gay, but not comfortable with that being known. And today, some of those people are super comfortable with that. And like they, they're able to articulate how our culture is, is figuring this out. And I'm, I think that's really exciting to be a part of that. And as someone who's involved in entertainment, and media, we realize that we, we have a voice there and we can actually affect that. Uh, and so I'm, I'm pretty excited that, that our studio is set up such where any person that's a part of it can feel comfortable expressing themselves through our games. So like a lot of the things you just heard Anthony talk about weren't in the game because there's any particular initiative or checklist or you know something that we're trying to do to cover the bases. It's because that's important to Anthony and he wanted to do that. And other people, all the people on my left, also are expressing themselves in our video games. And, uh, and it's, it's, it's a reflection. So the games themselves become a reflection of, of, of cultural interests. And, uh, and I'm, I'm pretty, pretty excited that we all get to be a part of that. I know we have a lot of work to do. Uh, and I know we could be doing better for our part. Oh, and so like we all have a lot of work to do, but even our studio can do more. And so that's one of the other reasons why we came out here. We're gonna talk about some of the things we've done and our, the way we think and kind of expose ourselves a bit, but I'm also hoping, hoping that you challenge us and help us understand your thinking um, because that's, that's important. So in the Q&A session, please don't be shy. What are we, what are we doing next? Uh, <laughs> I believe it's, we're kicking it over to Graham. Okay, cool, all right. Uh, oh, so Randy kind of touched on uh, a lot of stuff. Uh, when I started at Gearbox, I was, I guess, in the closet at the office, but it was just because I was so focused on my career. Um, you know, growing up as a gay guy, you, like, you have this notion of the outside world and what people are going to think of you and what happens if you come out to the wrong people, what, what things would you have to change. And from the outside, like, being a kid who grew up playing games, you hear a lot of negatory, <laughs> negative things very often. Um, so at first, like, I always knew I wanted to make video games, so I, I just kind of was able to push that all out because video games were it, and no matter what, I was gonna make that my career. Um, and so I kind of built up this, and I'm guessing most of you in this room have really thick skin when you play, well, any first person shooter, but, um, <laughs> And I got to the point where I kind of just accepted it as part of the culture, and I, can st I would still go and play my games, get to the top of the scoreboard, and feel good about myself, and that was that. Um, but it wasn't until I met my future husband, and he was not a gamer at all. He had never played any games uh, growing up. I think, I think he played Zelda at one time, or he really liked Zelda, um, <laughs> back on the NES. But he never played on consoles or on PC and a first person shooter. So when I introduced him to like those kind of games, he would hear those kind of things. And for me, they just go over my head at that point. I just completely blocked them out. Uh, but it wasn't until he, he started to feel hurt seeing that stuff that I kind of like stepped back and like, you know, just because I had accepted it as what it was for me, it didn't mean it was actually right. 
Um, so it was after I met him and he called it out that I kind of decided to put myself out there and when I see that kind of stuff happen in games, I kind of, I don't try to make a big deal out of it, but I try to say like, if someone's acting like an idiot, just call them a the fucking idiot. Like, you don't have to do that kind of stuff. And so I encourage all of us as a community not to like be mean-spirited, but just to like politely say if you see that kind of stuff, like, hey, that's kind of douchey. You can, you can use any other word to describe your frustration. Um, and I thank him for getting me to do that. Uh, he's very nice. Um, and and you know, as I accepted that I, and started a day rich, I knew that Gearbox had this kind of culture that accepted that, and I obviously came out to the office after I met Rich um, in Gearbox because Gearbox had created this culture to thanks to Anthony um, and other people at the office. <laughs> really, to, to like... It had nothing to do with me. It was, no. There were other things at play. Yeah, but I knew that Gearbox was a safe place to come out to and um, share my view. And as, as Randy said, it's a, we all have these great peers and we are free to talk about these kind of things at Gearbox and that turns into these great characters that have authenticity. Um, I think that's, as a gay guy, I like to see real characters. And I think any person, straight, woman, whatever, you just like to see real characters. Um, and I think uh, Gearbox has some great artists that do that and some great writers that do that. Uh, and I'm very proud of that. So, that's my bit. Yeah, uh, when we were talking about this before, you said we don't want to define the character solely by their sexuality. Yes, um, I think probably every queer, gay, straight, everything, you don't want to be, no one in here, I'm guessing, wants to be defined by their sexuality. We're all proud of it, and it's a part of our lifestyle, and it's part of who we are, but everyone in here has a million other parts of their life and about their personality that they want to have the world notice. Um, and I think what Gearbox strives to do is take sexuality, gender, whatever, and use it as a way to reach, more, reach a larger audience and to give people something to connect with. When you connect with your characters that you're playing or, and you can identify with them, you get more invested and that makes for better entertainment because the stakes are automatically higher. Um, so in the games I play and here at Gearbox, I'm always looking for what is a real character and how are they authentic. And if their sexuality happens to be similar to mine, that's just another facet that I can connect to. Um, there's lots of great examples of that in games now um, and it's becoming I mean, we're here because it's becoming more of an issue and there are more games like uh, David this morning from BioWare and what they've been doing and all kinds of other studios that are, uh, Naughty Dog, they're starting to step up and add these kind of characters. And I think that's um, a great way of reaching an audience and making those characters more real and uh, more interesting. Well, it's normalizing too. Um, like one of my, one of my favorite aspects of Sir Hamelot's character isn't that he's gay, it's that his sexuality is, actually doesn't matter. Right. right? It's not like, it, and, and what's cool about that is when, you, when, you, when he reveals it, it's just sort of like, oh yeah, I had an old boyfriend that did this, and it's just as if that's totally normal. And, in, and we like to think that in Pandora, in, in Pandora, in this you know, universe we've created, there's absolutely nothing odd about that at all, where it's just totally the course of normal existence, and that, that's awesome. I like that. So speaking of characters and all that, um, there's a new Borderlands game coming out, and it has characters in it. Yes, it has. <laughs> uh, so this elegant. is Chris Failer. He's <laughs> PR and marketing. Head of marketing Hi. and PR at Gearbox Software. <laughs> I have also been designated by everyone here to keep us quote unquote on track. Okay. We have about three pictures that we want to show and at some point I have to steer the conversation back okay. so that we Do can it. go into the pictures. Steer it. Drive well, away, you did it so Captain. elegantly and so effortlessly before that I'm sure. <laughs> Why, Anthony, tell us about the four main characters. <laughs> 
how, how about fuck you? <laughs> Somebody else want to do that? I've talked too much already. Well, I think earlier today you and Randy were talking about how we came to the decision to have two, le two female characters in this. Yeah, it was, a, it was a, literally a 15 second conversation. Yep. That's the story. Uh, I, I remember it differently. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's just a continuation again of, of uh, previously mentioned masturbation, but I hope you enjoy it. Um, which is that we really wanted to have a one-to-one -one ratio of males to females in terms of the playable characters in the pre-sequel, and it was a very, very uh, trivial thing for us to decide to do. Not saying that with any subtext whatsoever. I, what's funny is my memory of the interaction about like when we were talking about the characters, like my, my focus is always like, okay, what characters would be interesting because of the timeline that we're looking at, um, and also which characters might give us gameplay that might be fun, right? And Anthony then said, that's not how I remember it, and he's <laughs> talking about how he was like kind of agitated. He's like, no, this other character has to be, has to be Athena. And I'm like, <laughs> I don't know, how, how, what was your memory of that? Like, my memory was basically we had we had we knew we wanted claptrap we we knew we wanted uh, Nisha the sheriff and we knew we wanted Wilhelm because of the way the story is sort of structured, and then we had this other idea for a character that was a male, and I wasn't that that had been the first time that I'd ever tried to speak up about anything diversity related in like a meeting with like you with like the big man, uh, and I didn't actually speak up I just got like really shitty and passive aggressive. <laughs> And I was like, God damn it, fuck it, yeah, sure, fine, yeah, have a claptrap, great, it'll be awesome. And then you were like, what is going on? <laughs> and then I told you, and you're like, all you had to do was tell me that, it's fine. And then three seconds later, I was like, okay, cool, it'll be Athena then. And it was <laughs> one and done, it was great. And I'm grateful, because Athena's like my favorite character now. Yeah. I, she's so awesome. In yeah, this she's game, like so. the fulcrum of our entire frame narrative and all that stuff, so yeah, I'm, I'm really glad that happened. <laughs> <laughs> that wasn't supposed to be a joke. I, and so what have we learned? <laughs> You'd be very open with Randy. <laughs> what about some other characters in pre-sequel? Janie Springs? You well, want to talk uh, about her? I've been working with Janie a lot. Um, the section of the game I'm working on is towards the very beginning. And uh, we created this new character um, called Janie Springs uh, who lives on the moon. And like she, you do. Yeah, like, like you do in Borderlands. And... Uh, <laughs> She's kind of a badass. I, um, she uh, she can hold her own, and she basically introduces you to the to the moon to Alpis and shows you around. And depending on who you are, uh, you actually find out that she's gay as well. And she's like the first second new character that you meet in the whole game. Yep. Right. No, she's the first new character. Yeah. Yeah, first first new character that you meet in the game. And if you play, you know, we've done some work behind the scenes tech-wise that depending on the character that you are, you actually will start getting custom responses to all your little turn-in quips and back and forth. And so her and Athena have kind of a back and forth relationship that um, over the course of They're the game. They're flirting. Yeah, they, they kind of, <laughs> over the course of the game, and as you, as you see her uh, throughout the game, you get to hear if you play as Athena different things or if a character that you're playing with is Athena, you'll get to hear it. Um, but she's great because she, she's just another character. Again, she's not like throwing it down your throat or anything. It's just like, hi, welcome to Elpis. I'm Janie Springs. Who are you? And then over the course of talking to her, you get to find out these other aspects of her life and it's very natural and it's not like a, it's not a big deal. And that's what's awesome about her as a character. It's not a big deal. Um, and working with her and scripting her around and making her hut and everything, it was kind of cool to work on the f first gay character I've ever worked on and actually be a part of that and like script around and make sure, okay, she's a character, so what would she do? What is her hut? It wasn't like, okay, she's gay. <laughs> awesome. <No. laughs> one, of, one of the things I love about the character is because of the idea, it's inspired this kind of iteration on the technology and the way the software simulation works where the, the context of her interaction with the player depends upon which player you're controlling, which character you're controlling. And that's kind of cool. Like, it's kind of encouraging a gameplay evolution, which we should be getting anyway. You know, there should be, like, it doesn't matter about uh, uh, you know, who, who, who the character I'm playing should have an effect on how people interact with me and relate to me. Yep. Um, anyone in this room might re interact with me differently than they might interact you know, with Graham or Rochelle and 
we should have that same experience in video games if we're going to have a game where we can choose different characters. And it'd be meaningful. Yeah, and, and it's kind of neat that this character kind of inspired that iteration in our, in our software. Yep. So switching gears a bit, Ashley, before we go into cosplay and talking about characters and all that, yeah. what is a content artist? What is a content? Okay, so we've been, um, the industry is still, uh, like, we don't exactly, like, you might have a title at one company, but it'll mean something completely different at another. So an environment artist, like, a lot of people think, okay, well, you just make stuff in the environment, which is usually what I call what I do. Um, so it's like, you know, anything that's not a character is generally what, a, like, an environment artist does. So that includes buildings, rocks, grass, anything. Um, but then you also have, environment artists might also mean that you build things. So content, we're kind of talking about content artists being, you make the content that goes into the game, and you might have an environment artist put that stuff together in, in a level, you know, game design, it's gotten crazy. We have so many. <laughs> so it's, what, are, yeah. what are some of the things you've built in your role as a content artist, things that players might recognize? Um, well, one of, I've had a, um, just being an environment artist, I've had to do anything from like a crate, but then I've gotten to do some creature stuff. So my favorite thing I've ever done was for Borderlands 2, because of all the new creatures we had to do, um, we had to go back into some of the older ones, and so I actually did this, the new Skag for Borderlands 2. So that's, my, that's one of my favorite things I've gotten to do. Space crates <laughs> so. are also important. It, I know, they're very important for level designers. We yeah, level designers love let's a good not, space crate. So. Let's not marginalize our crates. No. Oh, no, no, I'm not marginalizing They are fundamental all. to all game design. They are. <laughs> So, have you done any work on character skins? Uh, yes, actually. I've, um, we've had, um, are you wanting me to talk about that one thing? You can if you that want to. Thing. Um, we've, had, we've had a few skins um, for, uh, I don't know if I want to talk about the specific one, or. Okay, well, I'm just gonna hit next. Yeah, just okay, that's fine, line. that's fine, that's fine. Hey, you know what? It, oh, you're talking that, about these skins? Yeah. That's these where it was going. I didn't hear what you were thinking. Oh. <laughs> no, this is great. Do it. Oh, no, we've, we've had to do some back and forth on some, some skins for some, um, um, particularly I got to do some of the skins for uh, a lot of the Headhunter packs, because um, I've had to work on like all the DLC, and that's been, that's been a lot of fun. Um, but we had to do uh, some skins for like the Siren. We were doing like Thanksgiving theme stuff, so we had to do a lot of that, and we were having a lot of back and forth, like, hey, how do we make this stuff like, like, cool and actually fit in and, you know, not be offensive. The Headhunter packs, by the way, in yeah. case you didn't play them, they were all uh, holiday themed. Yeah. So Thanksgiving, Christmas, Halloween. We found a way to make Easter into one of them. That was really... Yeah. yeah that Amanda was... did some work on that. Yeah. Yeah. The, yeah. The and you kill a boss. Contest Salvador was my doing. <laughs> oh, that one was amazing. Yeah, that, that one was amazing. <laughs> That was like one of the first things I got to do at Gearbox, so that was pretty fun. Awesome. <laughs> okay, so in the course of all of that, yes. it, you were telling me about one time where you felt there was a costume that kind of went a little too far. Yes. And then you pushed back on it. Like, how did you actually deal with that, and what was the, res the re end result? Yeah. Which, which one are we talking about? <laughs> I just wasn't sure if we were supposed to say. Um, <laughs> I don't want to get in trouble. How uh, it's fine. How, oh, it's fine. How can you get in trouble? We're in a safe I don't place. Know. This here is a safe place. No one, know, okay. is anyone here going to get us in trouble? Amongst this is friends a safe and <laughs> It's a safe place. Okay, okay. Uh, well, we had um, for uh, the Thanksgiving one in particular, um, I got tasked to do the siren skin for that, and she is dressed in all leather, and she's supposed to look kind of Native American, and we... Um, we got some versions of it that I saw, and I was like, hey, maybe we should be a little bit more respectful of that culture, because I don't want to get a news story out of this. Yeah. <laughs> if I so, yeah. 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 Uh, so we just, it, all it was was just like, hey, maybe we could you know, just adjust this a little bit. That's really, we just needed a little bit of a paint over, and so just commented in the task, and um, you know, just, you know, just talk to the artists, and it was, you know, it was fine. There was no, there was no pushback or anything. It was just like, hey, just point it out, and they're like, oh, yeah, sure, you know, what that's I totally love, cool. What I love about this, one of the things that's important that, that I've tried to make sure we can have in our culture is that 
you, you can't, like each one of us has our own experiences, right? And, and each one of us kind of knows if something's right by us or not. Sometimes people can do really offensive things just totally accidentally. And it's only with a diverse studio that there can be those voices that can help us understand uh, if something, like some, something that one person might do innocently might actually be really bad culturally or you know, to, to the feelings of someone else. And if we have a spectrum of people in the studio and diverse representation in the studio, then there's a voice that might understand that before something comes to be and can speak up and make change happen. And that's, that's awesome. Mm -hmm. I love that. Yeah. So, so you're gonna sell us something now? Yeah. So one thing we like is cosplayers. I think you saw it earlier, we had some pictures of Ellie. Um, and Ashley actually helps out with a lot of our fans and our community, getting a lot of those cosplayers ready. Um, one thing we learned in the course of developing pre-sequel is that the characters from Borderlands 2 also like to cosplay. <laughs> <laughs> So, that's happening. <laughs> These are the Borderlands 2 characters cosplaying as the Borderlands pre-sequel characters. <laughs> <laughs> so like, look, look at like, Zero is dressed up as Claptrap, <laughs> right? Like, for example. <laughs> so, and, and these are gonna be free. Yeah. Uh, we'll have more details on these soon, but these are going to be available in-game beginning next Tuesday. So, And what, what, what we're going to probably do, um, I'm probably going to be tweeting shift codes. So if you follow my Twitter, you can get first access to these. So, yeah. And then, and then we'll find other ways to get them out for more people down the road. Cool. Okay. So, Ashley, you want to talk a bit more about cosplay? Oh, sure. Um, as as a company, like we, like we adore cosplay. There's actually quite a few um, cosplayers at the company now, which is really awesome. Um, uh, we have um, we've seen. Do we have the the slide up? I don't know. Oh, um, we have. We've actually seen quite a few gender bends. Which um, gender bend cosplay just means like you take the the character and it might be one gender and you can make it another. Um, you make it whatever you want, and um, you know we have uh, we call it was it handsome Jacqueline or Jacqueline, um, <laughs> which I, I love her. She's so great. We actually have um, I know I've seen pictures of her up in the studio. Um, um, I've also seen recently a uh, Lady Torg, um, done by It's Raining Neon. Um, she is I mean she's fantastic. Which the the funny thing Anthony pointed out to me is that um, she's actually wearing more clothes than Torg, <laughs> even though she's the female version. And that's great. Um, I mean, we love seeing that just because it's, it's one thing to take one character and just recreate it, but just to make it, I mean, it's like making it your own. You get to just show your even more creativity. I mean, cosplay is creative as it is, but um, expand on the character. I mean, I've seen so many people come up with things that we might not have ever thought of. And so it's like we get inspiration from you guys cosplaying, you know, uh, you know our characters or however differently you do it. Um, I think I've seen a guy walk around with like, I've seen all the Claptrap guys. Um, oh, we have the male Mad Moxie. Yeah, I forgot about him. He's, you know, that's, I wanna see more of those. <laughs> like I wanna see more, more male Mad Moxies. That's like, that's really cool. That, um, that dude, uh, that, at PAX East, we had all the cosplayers come up on stage and there was a male Mad Moxie there that just got like everybody freaked out. There were like 3,000 people in this theater and they just <laughs> screamed, they loved it. And that was a really diverse audience, you know, so, and they all really loved that. It stood out, so. If you're a cosplayer and want to get even more attention, put a twist on it. Yeah. yeah. So Amanda, what have you been working on lately? <laughs> yeah, so much talk about Borderlands, but, uh, I was actually hired to work on Battleborn. I've done a little bit of Borderlands, but for Did about... Did you guys notice that we announced a new video game? <laughs> <Did anybody? laughs> so Gearbox announced Battleborn on, was it Tuesday? Yeah. Yep. So it was just Tuesday, so it was just a few days ago, and this is our next original game. So, yeah. I'm excited. <laughs> 
Yeah, Battleborn is really exciting to work on as a concept artist because it's a character-based game where not only is like the sky the limit, but the universe is the limit. We could, we're basically able to pull from all kinds of different sources and be like, what, what is a hero, really? Like, what can a hero be? What is inspiring to different people? Um, I can set you up with the premise really quick, since some of you might not know the premise. Uh, the, the narrative premise of Battleborn takes place in the very, very far dis distant future. We know that at some point our own star will supernova and be gone. And eventually all of the stars in the entire universe will burn out. There's going to be a point where there's going to just be one star left, the last star. And at that, in that point in the future, every species, every civilization that's ever appeared on any planet, on any distant solar system that has the ability to travel the stars will probably end up all you know, coalescing, converging around that last star. So you're going to get not merely you know, a diverse array of people, but a diverse array of every species one could ever imagine. So from a, um, from a concept design point of view, it's, uh, it's, uh, I mean, it's the ultimate buffet, right? Mm -hmm. We also have a ton of freedom because we're really, really pushing stylization. Uh, Borderlands is stylized, but Poplar is even more so. And so that gives us freedom to explore a much wider range of different body types, different species, um, <laughs> that sort of thing. So I, I can talk a little bit about the character I've designed that's been released so far, who's on the cover. This one. Her name is Reyna, and she is our rogue commander. So she's like a little bit of a scoundrel, freelance commander, a bit of an anti-hero. So when she was actually the first character I was assigned to do at Gearbox, which was really exciting, because I was like, oh, that that sounds awesome. And um, Montana, who is the giant juggernaut guy, had just been finished. So I, we, the art director and I were kind of brainstorming, like, what can we do with stylization um, and pushing this exaggeration in a way that is unconventional and a little bit unexpected and also bring another uh, body type into the roster of early characters. So I was thinking about the fact that in most games and not just games, but media across the board, the heroic silhouette is almost always depicted as the triangle or a very, very masculine silhouette. That's sort of like the visual shorthand for strength, but I don't think it has to be that. And so with Reyna, we were like, all right, if Montana is this kind of hyperbole of masculinity, of the triangle, what happens if we take that and invert it and make a uh, more bottom heavy character and represent like uh, a more pear-shaped pear kind of female silhouette in a way that's really grounded and badass and strong and empowering so uh, that was pretty cool to work on her. Um, I, I'm excited for you guys to see more about that too. I think what's cool about Reyna is not only did you do the core character, but you did even the weapons and everything she's holding in her hand. Mm -hmm. And it even extended to some of her personality mm -hmm. and the way that she acts in the game. Yeah, uh, she's very, very aggro, but also kind of smooth and in control. Um, it's, it's fun on Poplar. The concept artists aren't only responsible for just the visual design, but we work pretty closely with the gameplay designers to talk about their different move sets and the way that they're gonna move and the way that we're gonna animate. We, we'll do full sheets of keyframe animations and that sort of thing. Um, yeah, we really try to integrate the process with the writers and the designers to sort of like what Graham was saying before, to create a character that is multifaceted and not just sort of one-dimensional, this is what it is, but it's across the board very unified and cohesive and unexpected. Plus she has a cape. Also she has a cape. I love capes. I also love... Amanda did not watch The Incredibles. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, it's only like a tattered piece of a cape, so it might have like less of a chance of getting... Uh, getting sucked in. I also really am obsessed with doing characters' hair, so I gave her a crazy, swoopy pompadour. Uh, yeah. 
So she's going to be a, I think, I expect her to be kind of a discoverable character. I think, like, on, on first look, she might be overlooked, but I think that there's going to be a, a segment that Raina becomes the favorite for, and I, I'm, I'm looking Raina's forward to seeing Raina's my favorite. That. Yeah, a lot of people like her. At the yeah. yeah, she's my favorite. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So one of the things we mentioned earlier was knowing that we can do better. Um, Randy, Anthony, what can we do better? And what are your ideas for well, if we knew, ahead with we'd that? be doing it. <laughs> well, what about say making female bandits? Yeah, uh, we want to do that. So do the that. when you talk about you know why might not have more female player characters or whatever, there's there's not really a good reason. Um, talking about having more female bandits, we were a li initially a little bit leery of doing it because like on the one hand, it's super cool to have gender parity and enemies um, because you're implying that you know they're of equal deadliness and that's all super cool. But on the other hand, like you know, violence against women is a real thing, and it might be a little bit weird to be in a game that's really over the top and have you know burning a woman alive and stuff like that. Is like is that feels inherently kind of different. And I was curious to ask you guys how you felt about that. We're we're introducing we're hoping to introduce some um, some female bandits, some female psychos in um, in the Tales from the Borderlands, the Telltale game, um, if everything goes according to plan, and that's going to be really cool. Um, but I was curious to know, once question time comes around, assuming we have time for it, uh, how you guys sort of feel about you know gender parity in enemies that you fight as well. There are some female bandits in um, in the pre sequel that are really cool. They're they're big like spacesuit having um, badasses. But yeah. he said the word general, par uh, sorry, gender parity, parity, not par not parody. Not parody. Yeah, sorry, parity. <laughs> yeah, equality. And we want to have a playable trans character like you and I have talked about a lot. Anthony and I have been trying to amongst us trying to see if we can encourage a playable transgender character in the game. And I, I first was inspired by this. Um, there's a friend of mine who is transgender who was a programmer on Borderlands 2. And um, she taught me a lot, actually. You know, it's really, it's really difficult. If you happen to be someone who's, um, whose genitals match your orientation and whose orientation and genitals also match your kind of, you know, self image. If you happen to be one of those, it's kind of difficult to intuit uh, the reality that, that there's, a, there's different things that affect each of those vectors, right? There's a lot of diversity just in the biology of how our genitals might have ended up. And there's a lot of diversity in what we might be attracted to and that's a, those are completely different vectors. And then the third one is the vector of how we see ourselves. I used to be kind of a, a bigot against um, women that got fake breasts. Um, I thought there must be something wrong with them and that's, there's a weakness there. And I, I was actually kind of not, I was kind of intolerant about that. And uh, she helped me understand that it's probable and Com not, not uncommon for human beings to see themselves differently than they're actually built. And that the way our brains are wired is not always exactly in parity with the way our, our um, you know, all the things that relate to how our bodies form um, might, you know, might end up. And, and if that's the case, how fortunate is it if we can do something about that with science? How fortunate is it that modern medicine can help um, uh, help to some degree, and, and, and if we're fortunate as a species, we'll get even better at that. And that, that was a really awesome kind of discovery for me, you know, that, that, she, that she helped me figure out. And ever since then, I thought, man, we really need to cover that in some way and get that out there. And so I've been kind of subtly trying to encourage us to get a transgender playable character. Um, and, I, and I think we will, it, it, it certainly at some point. And, you know, there's, there's, other, there's other frontiers even beyond that, uh, that might be even farther off. You know, there's there's a whole there's so many different ways that we can be unique, or and then because of uniqueness, feel marginalized. Um, and it'd be nice for us as a studio to cover s as many of those as possible. Um, I, I do think we're we're likely, you know, because there's there, there I'm not going to lie, there is fear when when you have creative people that that are taking their time and trying to make something that other people like. There is fear, but but. 
you know, there's also a lot of courage, too. And so I think it's very probable that, for example, we will have a transgendered playable character even before we have an openly atheist trend, or atheist uh, playable character, right? And it kind of shows the different layers of those frontiers of, of um, you know, equality and acceptance. And, uh, and I, I, hope to, I hope our studio can be one of the ones that's kind of, you know, part of that vanguard. Uh, and, and I know we're, we're pushing for it. That's it for what we had to, what we wanted to cover. Uh, we've got a couple minutes left. What we'd really like is to hear from you guys. If you have any questions, get the hands up. I'll come to you. And then uh, we'll all be hanging around afterwards out in the hallway. Our Twitter handles will be up here. So please, please, thanks Randy. Yeah. Please, any thoughts, comments, whatever, let us know, reach out to us however you feel comfortable. Uh, hands, you're the first one I saw, and then I'll head over there. Hey, uh, awesome talk, thank you very much for that. Uh, so going back to Anthony's question, uh, when he said that, like, my heart kind of raced a bit because I'm like, holy shit, you know, what if that really happened? Because no one's ever done that to the best of my knowledge. Like, women enemies in games that you can actively commit violence against. And uh, it's a weird thought. I mean, I'm a straight white male, so obviously my perspective is kind of warped in those regards. But I think you should include female enemies in games because why not, right? I mean, you have the equality there. and. I'm sure there are plenty of girls out there that would like to kick girl enemies' asses in games. So, um, yeah, I say go for it. And uh, make them all transgender atheists, too. <laughs> Anthony, any rebuttal to the, fill the dead space while I walk? He didn't need his face to not crack. I mean, I would love to hear an opinion on that question. And I mean, no offense by this, but from someone who's not a straight white dude as well. <laughs> Hello, um, about the question on females uh, being, I guess, violent acts, I guess, but uh, I don't really see a, I don't really see a, I don't really see a serious problem with it. I mean, Dragon's Dog might have that, about random females running around trying, trying to kill you <laughs> repeatedly. Um, I would just summon meteor storms at them and just go about my way, but, and then you did, you did it before with the uh, sheriff, I can't remember her name right now, but. Nisha. And that and was, that was one the lawbringer. I, yeah, yeah, that was one of the favorite um, bosses that we had. Um, for, as far as people playing online, everybody enjoyed fighting her, etc. The smart remarks that she always made when taunting people, <laughs> etc. So I don't really see a problem with it as long as it's done well, you know. So if it's just a bunch of we always people, try to do things well. Yeah. <laughs> if it's just a bunch entertainment of females, subjective though. Sometimes our most Committed efforts have made people disappointed, so you never know. Right. Yeah, I don't see a problem with it. Um, like I said, it was just random chicks just running around trying to kill you. I mean, you were going to shoot back, right? <laughs> so there's you. also just another vector, too, that could be weird, which is like, I don't want to give misogynists something that they enjoy too much, yep. you know? I would hate for people to fight the sheriff over and over because it reminds them of an ex-girlfriend or something. <laughs> that would be really upsetting to me, but yeah. It's a downer. Sorry, I didn't mean to like completely <laughs> kill the mood. <laughs> Fart jokes. I'm not, um, I don't know if working or not. Okay, great. Um, I just wanted to ask, so I mean, it's great that you guys are doing so much to um, advance the work in the LGBT industry. But when I look at video games, I still feel like, you know, obviously as a person who is black, gay, and I was born with cerebral palsy, so I've had it from birth. I, I see nothing. Like, coming to this conference was, like, choosing cosplay was the most difficult thing I had to do because I have nothing to choose from. And so it's, I know that there are industries that are looking at that, but I feel like there are companies that view disability as weakness. Like, that is typically how it's represented, as weakness and broken, and therefore, you know, some parts are, not as great as others. I mean, I can only think of very few examples of characters that aren't represented that way. Um, I think Killer7, uh, the main character, Harmon, who has all these personalities that are just badass. Um, but I, you know, I was thinking, in terms of the characters that are coming in the future, I would love, I mean, Borderlands is punk, 
like there's there's so much technology in there that it kind of just makes sense to me to have characters that have disabilities but that are also equally badass yeah. and i feel like that game is a perfect place to start and so i would personally love to see more of that because there's millions of people like myself and we just don't see it so i, I agree my um my nephew has cerebral pal palsy and um when we did uh when we were doing add-ons for half-life um, one of the, those are the first games my studio made. Uh, we created a character for Half-Life that was in the PlayStation 2 version of the game, uh, the add-on pack called Decay, and it was a co-op campaign. You played as the two female uh, heroes that were the first two that got the, um, the suits. Like, I don't know if you remember Half-Life when Gordon Freeman picked up his suit, there were two empty canisters next to that. Well, we created these two female characters that were the leads, you played them cooperatively, and your main kind of driver of the story was a doctor we created named Dr. Kreiner, and he was in a wheelchair, and he had cerebral palsy. And, um, you know, I wish that stuck on more, and I wish Valve kind of kept that character and brought him forward in Half-Life 2, but, you know, they, they, had, they, they did a pretty good job with Eli, I thought. Um, you know, he's missing a leg, and... Um, but I do agree. I think that, that disability is another thing that we can cover more. There was a character in Borderlands 2 that um, had a stutter. I don't know if you remember her. Karina, I think, was her name. And she was afflicted by some um, uh, toxin that was in, in her community in the, in the town she lived. And we got a letter from a guy later who had fought in uh, Iraq, and he, re he received a wound in his, in, his, in his brain that caused him to stutter. And he sent us a letter that it was amazing. I mean, it really just made my heart swell. But the, the gist of the letter was, when I first encountered this character with a stutter, my first thought was, okay, here we go. Stutterers are never represented in games. This one's going to obviously gonna end up in a joke, right? Because every time there's ever a stutterer in a movie or a television show or a game, they're always making fun of the stutter. But in fact, there was, we didn't make fun, it was just part of her character. And, uh, and the story that involved her was actually, you know, she, she enlisted the player's help to murder a misogynist. Um, <laughs> so it had really nothing to do with her stuttering at all. Um, and, you know, so there's some places where we've touched upon it, but yeah, I mean, I, I, think, we, I, think, I think we can cover more uh, with, with disabilities. And there's so many things that can afflict us. Um, and it's useful, I think, to, to, get, a, to, get, a ta to get a sense, to both so that we can identify if we happen to be afflicted, but also so we can understand if we're not. Uh, and what a, what a better way than interactive entertainment, because it's a simulation, to kind of get a sense of what it must be like to feel an impairment. Right? We can actually maybe get things across to a, a player that you can't get across in a, a, a literature or in, in a film or something. So uh, thank you for that comment and that influence. I bet you that that comment will affect all of us here and that you'll probably see some more, uh, some, some disabled character that might arrive in the future. Yeah. All right, we have time for one or two more. Uh, as a reminder, if we can't get to you, we're just gonna be outside in the hall. They're probably gonna make us move so that we don't create a fire hazard, but if, just look for Randy's shirt. You can't miss it. <laughs> Hello. Uh, there are two classes that I, uh, well, not classes, but just uh, traits that people have that I see have very little representation. And one of them I'm seeing more often is people who are affected by autism. The other one, though, that I don't see any representation for is the asexual people. And will we be seeing anything like that coming up in the future? Because not everybody is turned on by things people are turned on by. How do, how do you represent asexuality? Because I think there's a lot of characters in Borderlands that have no sexuality at all. You want a you hot scoop? <laughs> yeah. Everyone want a hot scoop? Hot scoop. Um, <laughs> if we ever make a, another Borderlands game and like Maya, the siren from Borderlands 2, is a, uh, a non-playable character, uh, I wrote her with the intention that she is asexual. Um, there's a thing going on with her and Krieg in that short video we did where he's got a big crush on her, uh, but if everything goes according to plan, she will not reciprocate because she is asexual in my mind. Hey, I actually wanted to talk about the uh, gender parody thing again. Um, and it's cool that you're thinking about like violence against women as a real thing, but I also want to point out that the fact that there is currently 
a lot of research that shows that um, if men look at a group of people and about 17% are women, they think that there's, it's a 50-50 split and at 33% they think there's more women than men. So honestly, like, and that's something that has been reinforced over wow, and over and over and over. And can pretty you, much can you give me the source to that? Because that's really Gina interesting. Davis Gina Davis Institute Davis was one of them, yeah. I'd like um, to read that. What is it? So like, uh, I think that it's really important to, and, and I mean, I'm doing casting for a game right now that like with actual actors and I'm trying very hard to hit that actual 50-50 ratio because like that sort of thing can make it so that, thing, that there's an actual representation barrier there and I think as creators of media that that's something that we have to think about and worry about. Um, so while you, you are thinking about violence against women, um, I would almost say having an actual one-to-one -one ratio, if like a major game can do that or any major production can do that, that's like a huge asset to put to push back against this notion that, you know, that a minority of women is like even more than like is somehow overwhelming or too much. Um, and my only other concern would be like if you're doing violence against women, make sure that your voice actors are coached well so they're not making like weird sexy groans. Like that's like a major problem. Um, so like I would, I would prioritize that and just seriously do if, if anybody pulls off a one-to-one -one ratio, then mad respect. Cool. cool. Awesome. Uh, All right, everyone, unfortunately, uh, that's it. We will be outside, so please stop by. Thank you so much for coming by. Thank Cheers. you, thank, thank you very you. much. Thank you.